Hi, everyone, and warm welcome to Silo AI and NVIDIA webinar that we pulled up this time together in partnership uh, with Grow Technologies as our, as our guest, um, guest company here today. Uh, still waiting for just a quick moment so that everyone can get in. So today we have uh, more than 250 attendees from all over Europe. Uh, I was really excited to see all of you uh, attending uh, from UK, US, um, Central Europe, um, Germany, Italy, then uh, some like strong maritime countries, Netherlands, Greece, um, as well as the Nordics, of course, where Silo AI is based out of uh, here in Finland. And then obviously uh, many attendees are also coming from uh, Sweden, Denmark and Norway. So good to have you here. Okay, so um, let's kick in then. I can see that most of you have already arrived. Uh, so my name is Paulina Alanen. Uh, I do comms and marketing here at Silo and have the great pleasure of hosting this webinar uh, on sensor fusion for situational awareness today. Uh, this webinar is the third one that we're organizing this year. Uh, previously, we've had one on MLOps and then earlier in, on predictive maintenance. And if you're interested in those, you can go to um, the link that's shown on the left uh, hand corner, lower left hand corner of this slide. So silo.ai slash content, if you would like to see those. Uh, but anyways, today's topic, as I said, it's uh, sensor fusion for situational awareness. And sensor fusion is uh, this broad uh, kind of umbrella term for technologies uh, that enable eventually what we're going towards in this webinar as well, towards autonomous vehicles, autonomous vessels, be it on the ground or, or uh, in, the, in the land or in the sea. Um, and uh, permitting technologies like localization and uh, how to navigate, um, detect different objects and track them. Um, and just as a reminder for you all, uh, we do have a Q&A in the end. Uh, we'll try to reserve um, 15 minutes for all of your questions. And uh, since we do have four speakers today, um, I'm going to ask uh, the questions in the 15 minutes that are the last ones. Um, so you can already ask them during the show, but we will like um, we will take them in the 15 minutes in the end, uh, just to kind of uh, reserve some time for our our great speakers today. But since um, I already know what our speakers are going to talk about, I'm I'm sure you will have. Uh, some really good questions at the end, as this is a very intriguing topic. So, um, all right. Um, just wanted to still say, uh, if you're interested in our webinars in the future, you can subscribe to our newsletter uh, at Silo AI and browse all the way to the future. So then you can you can um, subscribe uh, to our newsletter and get information for all the upcoming webinars as well. All right, um, anyways, like I said, this webinar we're doing in collaboration with NVIDIA and uh, both Silo AI, my company, and then our guest Grok Technology uh, is a member of NVIDIA Inception. And Oscar here will tell you all about what that program is about later on. But here is uh, our stellar lineup of speakers today. So we have the pleasure of having this uh, in collaboration with NVIDIA, as mentioned, uh, Oscar Guerra, who is the deep learning startup account manager uh, for North Europe, Ireland and UK at NVIDIA. Um, he'll, you'll hear from him right after uh, this intro. Um, he manages over 700 uh, AI and data science startup across these uh, countries. And then with him, we have Azir Arans, 
um, he works for the NVIDIA Jetson components, uh, and he will have some uh, really interesting demos uh, today uh, that you'll see in just a moment right after Oscar. And then our concrete case uh, will be around Grog Technologies today. And uh, we have the great pleasure of having their co-founder and CEO, Juha Rokka, taking the stage today after NVIDIA. And so uh, Juha has worked for the majority of his career at the world's second biggest cruise ship operator, so Royal Caribbean International, uh, and then led Grog Technologies for the past uh, couple of years. And with him, we have uh, Silos, senior AI scientist, who's been working uh, in particular in the Grok project in the past. And he'll provide um, a more technical view on how he's been working uh, on sensor fusion together with Grok to create this situational awareness um, that will uh, sort of pave the way towards uh, autonomous vessels in the future. And here is still uh, a quick reminder of the agenda today. Uh, and now we can see that we're already a couple of minutes late. So let's kick in right after this um, uh, brief intro about Silo with Oscar and then with Grok after that. And as a reminder, please do ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, I noticed we have a lot of people uh, who are for the first time in silo webinar. So I will, I'll just keep this really brief. Uh, my intention is not to tell you all about silo. You can discuss with me or Jesus after this, um, but just to let you know a few basic things about silo. Um, so we're the largest private AI lab in the Nordics. Um, have, we've been founded uh, four years ago and doubled our headcount and revenue, so to say, every, every year. Uh, so pretty steady growth. And what we do is that we work as a trusted AI partner in fields like computer vision, natural language processing and machine learning, deep learning uh, for our clients, um, such as Grok or, or many others as well. And we have offices uh, here in Helsinki, where I'm based out of uh, a couple of others in Finland, and then in addition in Stockholm and Copenhagen, as well as Central Europe and uh, Silicon Valley. So this is uh, the expertise that I mentioned. So really our team, uh, our experts, they work uh, seamlessly as part of our client teams, uh, bringing this very specialized capabilities, talent and knowledge that they have in this field uh, to, to enable uh, bringing AI to our clients' products and services. And just briefly about the working model. So, um, the way we work is that we have uh, this service and consultation that we bring uh, to our clients, uh, our experts work together in the team as part seamlessly with our client teams. And then we also provide uh, this customizable solution in addition to the, um, the teams working there. And I believe this is my last slide from Silo. So some of the focus uh, segments that we work in. So today we're obviously more on the like uh, smart vehicles in a broad sense, vehicles and vessels side, but uh, we're not limited to that. So we do have a lot of clients in, in the industry uh, for smart devices and networks, as well as smart cities and citizens. So quite, quite broad spectrum of different areas where we are bringing these AI capabilities, as you can see. And here I have a couple of use cases. I'm going to browse this really quickly now, just for the sake of time. But in the handouts, you do have the company deck, so the presentation in case you're interested in uh, diving deeper in here. But now I would like to give the floor without further ado to Oscar and then right after him, uh, Azir from NVIDIA. So please, Oscar, go ahead. Thank you, and Thank you very much, Paulina, and a uh, great introduction here. Let me just bring up my slides and we can go from there. All righty, starting at the end. <laughs> okay. so. 
Um, thank you so much uh, for having me um, here at this webinar. It's uh, really, really great to see um, Inception members uh, coming together and giving back to the uh, community and, and ecosystem, uh, especially those like Salo AI who have been part of the program uh, for a long time, um, doing obviously amazing work in lots and lots of different areas. And uh, even new members like Groak, um, you know, doing some cutting, word, cutting edge work uh, in the maritime industry. So uh, yeah, it really warms my heart to see, uh, like I said, um, these, these key players in the ecosystem giving back to the community. Um, so I would like to give you a, a little bit of an overview of the Inception program and, and what it is. Um, but just let's start off with some, with some statistics uh, to kind of give you uh, a bit of an introduction to the scope of the program. Um, NVIDIA Inception has over 7,000 startups uh, all across the world. Uh, it is really an international community um, of uh, AI, uh, machine learning, deep learning startups that have come together and we're supporting them in lots and lots of different ways. Um, over 90 countries are, are represented and together these companies uh, cumulatively uh, make up of over $45 billion in funding. Um, the Inception program has, is growing dramatically and just to give you some, some stats for 2020, uh, the program grew 26%. Uh, so it really shows that Inception is is uh, is really uh, growing substantially and consistently, and it's obviously really great to see and, and to work with all these different companies working in all these different industries. Um, so at this point, you must be thinking, well, what is the Inception program all about? What does it entail? And I guess to summarize the, the program in a nutshell, uh, NVIDIA Inception is a virtual accelerator for startups and scale outs working in AI, data science, machine learning, deep learning, really anything that requires GPU accelerated computing. Um, in terms of its benefits, I like to break them down into uh, four distinct categories, what I call the, three, the four pillars of the program uh, that you can see on the slides right now. And the first of which, which very much is the core of the program, is all about us sharing our technical expertise, guidance, and knowledge with you. And this can come through um, your Inception program manager, like myself, uh, through us connecting you with industry experts within NVIDIA uh, to share their experience and, uh, and knowledge. Um, and of course, as well, we try to give you access to training. And this is a, a benefit that all Inception members act, get access to, which is the 200 online courses via the Deep Learning Institute. And the Deep Learning Institute, or DLI, is an amazing resource that I recommend all uh, Inception members, old or new, to take advantage of because it really helps you um, either get an introduction to GPUs uh, and how to use them, um, or if you're already using them, gives a really great insight to um, the wider uh, NVIDIA computing platform with about whether that be about how using SDKs or uh, frameworks. So it's a, it's a really amazing tool. Saying that, um, you know, quite a few Inception members join because of the second pillar of the program because it also provides, uh, uh, you know, help in, uh, in quite a challenging uh, obstacle for a lot of companies, which is getting access to compute. And we do this in two ways. The first is by providing preferential pricing on most of our NVIDIA enterprise level hardware. The second is by having partnerships with cloud service providers so that you can claim up to $100,000 worth of AWS credits and $45,000 of Oracle cloud credits. So whether you're on, on the cloud, on premise, um, it's all about helping you getting access to compute to um, train your models um, and then do inferencing on them later and everything in between. Um, these two pillars of the program, the access to expertise and the access to technology, are usually really important for companies who are still developing and iterating upon their AI and data science solutions. For those which already have one, this is where really this, this third pillar comes into its own, which is where we help you go to market. And this can be done via introductions to uh, partners, potential customers. Uh, we try and give you opportunities to speak and exhibit at events that we organize. So for example, at NVIDIA's GPU Technology Conference or GTC, I'm sure an event that many of you will be, uh, will be familiar with, um, that happened just, uh, just over a month ago. We showcased over 300 Inception members from all over the world. 
And this can be from a technical perspective, uh, giving them the opportunity to, give, to really deep dive into their technology or more from a commercial perspective as well. Uh, we also do a lot of co-marketing as well with our most mature scale apps, and that can take the form of videos, blogs, dev stories, etc. Finally, the final pillar of the program is all about um, getting access to uh, to capitals, to capital and introductions to VCs. And of course, funding is a core part for many and most startups across the world. And we attempt to introduce you. Uh, to you know, relevant VCs through um, NVIDIA GPU Ventures, which is the venture capitalist arm of, of NVIDIA, and as well through our new, newly launched uh, VC uh, connection program as well. Um, and of course, like I mentioned, this is all about connecting startups who are looking to raise funds to come to VCs and, um, and investors who are looking to invest into exciting and disrupting AI and data science startups. So that's Inception in a nutshell. I know that was a lot of information. Of course, I am more than happy to answer questions in the Q&A. Um, but for now, that is it from me. And I'd like to hand over to my colleague, uh, colleague Azir. Thanks, Oscar. I will share quickly my secondary screen here. I hope you can see it. So yeah, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be uh, quite fast. So um, I will try to show you how to make a quick example with a Jetson Nano, which is a device very useful for uh, education on AI. And also, it is a very good device for industrial applications. So I think it's a device you can buy just to learn. And finally, you can use it in a, in a real project, even in an industry project. So second. So basically, the Jetson Nano, it's, it's like the best platform to, to start with AI uh, from scratch if you want to learn something. Because it is a small and portable, it is an all-in-one computer, it's very low cost, it's around 60 euros in, in Europe, 60 something. It's very powerful for its AI tasks. And it's part of the NVIDIA ecosystem. So everything you, you train here, everything you infer here, will be using CUDA and will be up, up to date with everything NVIDIA develops. And you can upgrade, upgrade it always to fit any, any project size. So let's imagine you, you need more power. You always can upgrade from the Nano to a TX2, Xavier Next, or, a, or an AGX. Well, so if you, for example, are creating a project for a boat, and you can start probably with a Nano, but finally, if you want that in production, maybe you will prefer an AGX because of the speed and because of the capabilities it has, more memory, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these are some of the capabilities. Um, this is just to you to have some kind of a big picture of, of what this small thing can do. Uh, something <clears throat> relevant is the, the video encoding and decoding capabilities. So, for example, it can encode four videos at uh, 1080p, at 30, 30 frames per second, which is really good for this uh, small device. And also decoding can decode, to, yeah, for example, uh, two 4K videos at the same time. So this is really good to to have some cameras doing some kind of image processing around. It works really well with OpenCV, and also it works really well with um, any kind of neural network developed with a uh, PyTorch or, or TensorFlow. Uh, this is a quick comparison with other, uh, in this case, more educational or hobbyist devices, like the Raspberry Pi before or the Coral. As you see, in uh, with, with some of these models, uh, almost in all of them, uh, the, the NAN is much better because uh, this is using the, the CUDA environment, which is uh, perfectly tuned for these uh, models. And uh, let's go to some examples. Let's see some examples. So this is an example one of the community members made. So this is a post estimation. It's made live on the Nano, and it runs at 20, <coughs> I think it was 23 frames per second, <coughs> which is really good for the, for the size of the model. And um, yeah, as you see, works perfectly great with a camera and the nano. This is another fun example. Uh, so this is a famous YouTuber doing a kind of yeah, the activated Wolverine clones. So it, it detects the, the the head looking at the camera. It's gonna activate the clone. So it's an easy, it is an easy, exa easy example, but it's something you can you can start with uh, detecting faces, detecting poses. So but let's move now. <clears throat> 
to the vehicle awareness. So how difficult is to start from, from, from scratch? It's really easy. So I'm going to show you one example. Uh, also, if you, if you want to work directly with the Nano, it is really powerful because, for example, when I was developing things on the Nietzsche Nano, I usually have Visual Studio, the open source version, with a Telegram, with YouTube, and everything works. So even you can use the Jetson Nano as a small, powerful, kind of powerful computer. But let's see an example. <clears throat> let's go to this video. So in this video, I'm going to show you in five minutes, that takes the video, five, six minutes, um, how, how you connect directly the Nano and you do the installation. This is like an Ubuntu installation. It's the 18 version. And you will see how easy and fast it is to deploy a quick machine learning model and start doing some kind of object detection or segmentation in, in a road, for example, with vehicles and et cetera. Around. So basically, we are going to do the installation. It's like almost every installation. It's next, next, next. It's going to create a small sub file because uh, we only have two gigabytes. So sometimes we need more uh, physical memory for, for software to run because we want to have those two gigabytes free for the models to run faster. It's going to take a few seconds while applying changes. Of course, this is speed up a bit. Uh, usually, this process will take like 30, 40 minutes from start to from the start to the demo. Um, OK, I'm going to I'm going to open now. I'm going to see now the desktop. And we have um, well, I'm going to download first a GitHub repo, uh, which is a repo made by Dustin, one of our engineers. Uh, he has made a lot of demos there. So I'm going to download just a quick script to save some instruction. So I'm going to run this script, and this is going to execute these 10 commands. This is something you can do by yourself with one one download, like I did here, or you can write each command. And basically, what I'm doing here is just cloning the repository. This repo is going to ask during the installation um, which model we want to execute. So we have here a lot of models, probably, you know, DetectNet, the Google model, ResNet. So I can download all of them, or I can download the ones I need for the demo. <clears throat> In this case, I keep it by default. So everything is going to be download. The time will depend on how many models you download. Some of them are really big. These ones are around 40, 50 megabytes each one. And <clears throat> it's going to ask me if I want to install PyTorch. I only need to install PyTorch if I want to do some training. You can do training in the Jetson Nano, uh, but it's not recommended because, because it will take some, some extra time. Usually training takes like 40 minutes or something. So it's, it's it's better if you use the Nano for the inference. So I'm going to open a folder where we have some video examples. <clears throat> some of them are like this one. And this is a pedestrian one. So there are some people walking in a park, like these people walking here. So I'm going to use this example to, to test the, the object detection directly. So I'm going to run the detectnet.py, which is a script that directly starts doing some uh, object detections by default. It's going to start. It's go this is going to use the mobile net. Um, by default, it's going, to, it's going to use the mobile the mobile net model. And as you see, it's detecting the potted plant, persons. Uh, it's detecting it with maybe no so, not so much accuracy. Sometimes it's losing some persons. So we are going to change this model to increase the accuracy. If we go back to the screen where we have this kind of downloading models uh, menu, we will see different models. One of them is called the PetNet, which is uh, to detect pedestrians. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to execute the same script, but I'm going to tell now that I want to use the network PetNet. So probably I will see more accuracy now detecting the pedestrians. I'm not going to detect the, pot, the potted plant, but I will detect the pedestrians with much, much more accuracy. So basically, what I'm doing here, I'm going to pause it. And I'm saying, OK, I'm going to add the network equals PetNet. And just with this, I'm doing the detection directly on the video to detect the pedestrians with more accuracy. OK, first time takes a bit. Uh, first time I change the, the model. And now, yeah, now persons are detected with more accuracy and not detecting the plants. And basically, that is how this works. If you want to change the model, you just to, to choose network equals, and you add the models, and you can start detecting different things. Even you can add your own models here. And now let's see an example uh, with segmentation, which is more useful for vehicle awareness. Because when, when you are in a vehicle and you want to detect, OK, where you are in the street, where are the, where 
are the buildings, where is the sky, where is the road, where are the vehicles. So there is a script also called cefnet.py. And in this case, I'm going to use the network uh, cityscapes. The cityscapes network has uh, this kind of segmentation for different areas. So you will see another video. But you will see everything segmented by, by color. And there is a menu that I'm going to show you here, which uh, explain what each color is. And you, you will see yeah, that. The, side, the road is, is pink, the vehicles are uh, this kind of dark blue, the sky is kind of cyan, like yeah, clear light blue, uh, buildings are gray. So basically with this, uh, in a nano, you can start developing a kind of small autonomous vehicle. Uh, it could be a toy vehicle, but it's something to start with. And then if you want to increase the resolution, probably you need a better model because this model doesn't have a lot of resolution, and then you need maybe a more powerful Jetson. But always you can learn with this and then start scaling up to a bigger Jetson, bigger models. And if you need a lot of training power, maybe you can do the training on a GPU and then move the model uh, prepare for, for the Jetson. So basically, uh, that that is how you can do a quick detection from scratch. Uh, you only need to uh, do a quick li Linux installation, download a repository, and that repository has the examples, and you will you will be ready to, to start. Uh, you only need to change the video. Uh, you can add your own videos, or you can connect a camera and do the live detection. So basically, uh, the Jetson Nano is the perfect fit for education. If you want to learn more, it's really easy. Buy one Jetson Nano. Let us know if you have some any doubts. And if you are if you are passionate about teaching AI or you are connected with universities, you always can become a Jetson AI ambassador. If you become a Jetson AI ambassador, you will have a lot of uh, perks. So you will have some kind of um, sometimes even money to create events. Uh, you will have some access to uh, some of our deep learning institute uh, tutorials. And also, if you are a student who are passionate about AI and you don't want to teach, you can also become a Jetson AI specialist just by doing a quick project and uh, completing an online forum. If you have any questions, let me know in the Q&A. And let's move to Brook. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Azir and, uh, and Oscar. So next up, um, we will have Grope Technologies, which is our case for today. We always want to have some concrete case that really, well, with the NVIDIA's demo already, we saw really good concrete examples of what is possible with, with Jetson. But now we will take a more of a deeper dive um, into this croak. Um, Juha, do you have your presentation ready to go? Is that visible? Yes, yes, we can yeah. see it. All right, thank you. Thank you. It was really technical part, so I'm, I'm less technical. So what I'm going to tell is a little bit what, what we do, why we do what we do, and then, then why the sensor fusion is important for us. And, and Jesus will continue then the technical details about the sensor fusion. About the NVIDIA products, we use wide range of the, the NVIDIA products from the Jetson family all up to the V100 in the infrastructure side in our technology stack and in different parts of the product. So. There is a strong link there. But if we go quickly through my presentation, so uh, we are pretty young startup here in, in Finland, in Turku, actually, and, and established 2019. We are focusing on the, the autonomous related navigation solutions, meaning that, that uh, we are bringing the technologies which over the time will, first of all, help to the current onboard users and, and then later on will also also make things possible to make more autonomous. Uh, what we are developing is the is the, the so-called multi-sensor based intelligent voice advisory system. It's a group of the products, actually three products coming out, out in the market in, in, in uh, during the, the coming years and, and uh, that's uh, everything inside is is very important role is to the ai and sensor fusion and all this this kind of the technologies uh we have a with us we have a mitsubishi corporation so it's our strategic investor from japan and we have initially developed our product for keeping in mind that it's, it's going to be first launched in the japanese maritime industry 
for us it mainly means that we have done the, the research for the for the features in the product as well as some of parts of the, the ui design together with the, the stakeholders in japan the owners and operators over there but at the same time it means that we are ready for the global market and actually we already already have a discussions ongoing outside of the, the japanese market but japanese market have a have a clear need for this kind of the technology uh, with what we have done so far we are pushing through to the quite heavy r d program right now and we have we have grown our team especially last year we have a quite diverse range of the expertise and high skilled people now right now it's 18 people and there is the wide variety of the expertise ai machine learning central fusion software development in general the, the qi testing devops security and and so on the product management side so it's quite strong team and quite diverse range of the, the expertise so let's go there. so if we try to say one sentence what we are doing is is we are really focusing on to the, create the solutions which reduce to the navigation crew stress and ensuring the peace of mind during the operation in all kind of the conditions in all kind of the vessels so we try to make the operation to be uh, less stressful for the, the operators safer for the operators more efficient for the operators What I'm focusing in this presentation is our first product. It's so-called awareness system. It's uh, it's kind of the, the system which creates with the multiple sensor sources the ground truth for the, the for the, the user that what is surrounding my vessel and and uh, what are the important for me to know right now in order to, to operate my vessel properly and safely. This is this is the product. What is what is coming out still by the end of this year and and it's it's there it's under the piloting stage at the moment i will show something about that one and it's it's really aiming to the combine of the current technologies on board to the one single single ui for the end user so if you think about how it is today convert how it will be in our side so left hand side is is showing what it how the operator does operate today so he have to use the multiple systems to act this where he can see to the own position or whether the C chart as well as the ai so-called ais target ais is this automatic identification system where the other ships are broadcasting their position and other information and then they use the radar what is the, the reflecting the targets and then of course they use the, the bridge windows in order to the monitor the dignity practically they do the sensor fusion in, in in their head at the end of the day so they have to combine all these systems together and understand what is situation what is important for me what we do in our system is that we take take our sensor set which includes the camera system wide field of view camera system for the day and the thermal the night night vision as well and then through that one we take the, the AI machine learning to do the object detection and with the sensor fusion we then fuse the other data to that and to detect the object through the other means. There we have a have a radar information, we have a AIS, we have IMU for the, the for the floating position, we have dual GNSS for the position and heading, and then we have a C charts. And then magic happens here in the between. We apply to the sensor fusion and and so-called track fusion and bring that to the user on board in the, the in the ui so he gets from our ui the one single view everything what he have to combine to, today from the different source of information so this is the main idea of our our product and of course it's 24 7 giving the same quality over the time all the time and, and it's helping the user to the to have a less stressful operation. A little bit about the value proposition, why we do this one. Of course, we are in a lot of in the safety corner. So we are enhancing the safety of the operation and trying to avoid unnecessary loss of income and, and accidents to happen. 
But at the same time, of course, for the owners, since it's relatively difficult to get new seafarers on board and, and uh, to, in the current ships. So with this kind of new technology, it will also help them to attract the best people from the world to the operate on their ships. And for the cargo owner, of course, it's it's the better reliability, efficiency, better predictability, and uh, of course, to the, uh, also reducing the environmental risks and excess of the coast. So, why they should invest in the safety? So we have seen a lot of accidents, even lately, happening to the to the marine, and and very unfortunate. And if we can, if we can really help any of those not to happen that's that's our our purpose and aim and cost of those if, uh, accidents are always high and as well as the environmental impacts as we have seen lately in the, the next to the sri lanka for example so then a little bit about i mentioned the research we have done on the, the our in in our first market in the japan and, and we really went through the, the our our potential customers and ask them what kind of the function, how they see the current operation, what is the difficult, what should be, what would be best help them to, 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 to have a better better safety in the operation as well as, as feel more confident about what they do. And this is some of the feedback. So they have a two-sided problem kind of there, though if the weather is really good, they actually see too much. And it's hard to define what is really important for them and wh what is really the close to me, what is further away. So in our system, we will get to the distance information as well as we can separate the what kind of the objects they are around the vessel. And then in the current technology, the radar, there is the delay in the radar. They cannot track to the fast vessel necessarily that well. And uh, also, also, the, the, because of that, they have to look out from the window and, and monitor currently and try to combine combine the radar view to the chart view and and, and to the, what they see through the window. And in in our technology, well, it is the real time system, so it is it is no no delays as such. So it can provide the same information with the, the with the, the in in real time condition and. Uh, of course we can we can get to the get to the much better better overall overall situation awareness what is happening around and as well as to the track to the faster vessels as in the bottom bottom is the problem so. then a little bit more about that then if the radar for example break down what happens then well since our we have a multiple sensor to, to provide the information, we can still operate mm -hmm. with the vessel relatively well. Uh, one problem is that the radar cannot really tell what is what type of the vessel it is, and and it's categorized them all about the same size, and and cannot separate them. What we do, of course, we classify in our machine machine learning and, and object detection side the different type of the vessels, what they are. This is our current current categorization how we do those but uh, of course since we have we have our machine learning and ml ops as we call it developed to us and then from the data gathering all the way to the building the models and having annotation and everything in the between we can easily add the categories here so we have a we have a data available for it we can we can do the annotation work and we can do the, the model teaching side as well uh, then about the pilot installation, this is our first pilot. It has been running about about two months now on board of the Finnish operator VG shipping, Polaris VG is to the vessel. It's going from Finland to the all the way the southern part of the of the Europe. I think it's currently somewhere in, in Spain. And uh, we have installed our system there on the, the railing on the top of the, the bridge. So it is shown here. It's relatively small, so, so it's hard to see. But uh, but uh, our our aim on this system is that in the size-wise, the footprint point of view, it's very small. It's have all the, the all the sensors built in, so it is easy to install. It doesn't necessarily need anything from the ship other than the power. 
So it is it is direct and straightforward to take in use and as well as to operate. We have been now this two months time, we have been able to prove that the, the durability of the, the of the, the mechanics, of course, and, and it can stand in the in the conditions and provide the information, but we have been also able to the, pr prove to the end-to-end -end functionality such a way that, that we know that the system does function. And this is our first pilot. So we are coming soon into the stage where, where we are doing the, the other pilots in, especially in our, our target, first target market in Japan. And then last slide still as a reminder. So what we what we do as a sensor fusion, we collect all this information about the data sources. We apply the sensor fusion and all the all the mathematics and magics over there and then we provide that to uh, to the ui through to the onboard ui but also we have a cloud entity and our system is connected to the shore shore in order to provide to the user interface for the onshore people on in the office for to monitor the fleet but uh, this is briefly most, mostly what what we do why we do what we do now i think i hand over to jesus to, to go more in the detail that he covers the part of the technical how we do it in the technical means thank you uh, thanks you um i hope you can hear me well i will hijack your presentation with a video and i hope everybody has a good enough connection because uh, we're a bit late so i'm gonna go fast on the video We'll start playing right now. And I need to say that this is not a user UI as you would see it in the product. This is more like the, I'm stopping the video now. Um, this is more like the developer view. We are using raw some different uh, um, tools and this is just what the developers see while we do the sensor fusion. And um, let me introduce very quickly what we see here to the right. Uh, we have a map where the, uh, Ego vessel, so as ourselves are located, uh, this guy here in the bottom. I'm not sure if you can see my arrow, um, but it's to the right button. Um, then we see um, some sort of yellow orange circles, which are visual detections, uh, so objects that we see with the camera. And then there are some blue boxes, which are um, AIS detections. Um, and in this uh, video that I'm showing, unfortunately, we don't have radar data, so it's only going to be those two. And uh, then to the bottom left, you have um, the camera feed. Uh, so that's what you see with that camera uh, in this particular uh, data set. And you have um, some bonding boxes there. Uh, I'm going to show that with higher resolution maybe in a moment. Um, and then, like I was saying, you have those bonding boxes there to the bottom left, which is basically the objects that we are, are recognizing with those neural nets running on the NVIDIA GPU. And then to the top left, you have the so-called optical flow um, is, is a measure of um, the movement on the image. Um, and I'm going to stop the video here in a moment. Not sure if everybody can see that. Um, and this is important um, because we need to have um, very accurate understanding and precision of what's happening on the image so that we can actually uh, tell this is an object, yes. The neural net is giving me that this is an object, but also we want to know the velocity, the movement, so that we understand is it going to crash with me or is it going some other direction and I don't care about it. So that's there, um, that sort of um, optical flow. Um, and maybe I will mention also that I'm very happy that we are using NVIDIA because um, this is running for free. Um, I was quite surprised to find out that the later um, architectures have this um, uh, hardware block just to do this optical flow. And uh, we didn't really have much extra budget after the, the detections and so on. So um, it's very, very good that this is actually running pretty much for free in this um, later NVIDIA GPUs. Um, but moving on, uh, now I'm going to explain a little bit more what's happening on the map. Um, so like I said, we, we are that, um, guy here at the bottom with that green circle, if you can see that and some sort of ball and this um, red. Um, and we have to the bottom left those visual detections, those boxes and those vessels, and also this flow is a little bit overlaid. And I pause the video now because I want you to see um, how the system is um, 
finding this um, detection, uh, visual detection number two and number six, if you can see those are the closest vessels to us. And for the uh, number two vessels, you already had some sort of AIS detection because it's a large vessel and, and by the regulations, you need to have this uh, um, AIS sort of radio signal if you have more than certain tons or more than certain size. But this other guy um, is small enough that it doesn't need um, this AIS uh, signal. So the only way to detect this one guy is with the radar or with a camera. Uh, and in this case, it's detected nicely and it's here in front of you with certain velocity and trajectory. Um, so that's maybe um, one of the, the main uh, advantages that uh, such system that Grok is uh, building has over the more classic radar AIS um, sort of awareness systems in the maritime. Um, let's see what the video shows now. Um, I can maybe also explain that um, you may see some sort of uh, lines following those um, um, AIS. Yeah, I think I'm going to zoom now closer to explain that. Um, so this is basically, uh, I will stop here. This is basically um, an AIS uh, track because um, AIS is this, this radio signal that you need to say every certain second sign this boat. Uh, with this uh, uh, MMSI uh, kind of like maritime plate number and go in this direction. And those points that you see there is basically uh, when they send that signal. And then in the sensor fusion, we use these Kalman filters and so on. And we want to tell um, where you will be um, in the middle of the signal, right? We want to predict where you are now, where you will be. Um, and there, there was like a successful prediction in, in between. Um, so another vessel far away, nothing is happening there, but we are tracking it anyway. Um, and now we will zoom a little bit closer. And I believe it will activate this sort of CPA. Um, like I said, this is not the user UI interface, it's more like a debugging interface. So it's a little bit clutter like now. Uh, I didn't really try to make this very beautiful, but you can see there, um, some sort of closest point of approach with other vessels. If if a vessel was to crash with us, what is the closest point where we would intersect? That was some sort of visualization of that. And um, one, one um, challenge that we have here in Maritime is that um, doing the sort of um, projections or linking the 2D world that you see in the camera with the 3D world in the in the map is very difficult. Um, any small shake in the vessel, um, the moving with the waves and so on will make your estimation be a little bit off. And if you can see this um, orange yellow sort of line, that is the estimation of that vessel that we can see on the blue line. The blue line is sort of like the AIS track. And then the orange, like I said, is the visual track. So it's not always easy for the system to understand, are these two objects the same? And, and that is what, we need to do in, in the so-called so track fusion. We need to tell, okay, these two vessels are actually the same and we want to merge that information and we want to tell uh, that these are exactly the same object coming toward you or doing certain dynamics. And um, I think I want to move forward quickly because like I said, we don't have much time um, for the questions otherwise. Um, those red lines were, uh, it's kind of like the field of view uh, how much can we see with the camera? And um, yeah, I think I will stop it here, Paulina, so that we have plenty of time to answer all those many questions that are popping up. And if somebody asks me later about something, I can show again the video. Is that okay? Yes, thank you so much, Jesus. Uh, this was really interesting. And for the audience, uh, we're now moving on to the Q&A. Um, we might just keep the video video here as well, but uh, Juha has been answering uh, quite many of the <laughs> good questions that you've been having already by written. So you can, uh, for the audience, you can go to the Q&A and answered to see the written answers uh, for those. So, so one question or actually several questions that I would like to continue with Juha and Jesus here is like uh, these kind of difficult conditions uh, that you mentioned. So could you, Juha, just briefly comment comment on that, like snowy conditions or, or difficult conditions? Uh, how, how does 
uh, mm. the sensors work uh, under that kind of situation. Yeah, the environmental impact is, is of course always always in there and, and will affect uh, what uh, it will mostly affect the accuracy of the detection and distance what can be what can be detected and how far. Uh, we are working on so-called dynamic capability. So by by knowing all the time how far we see in this specific condition, but of course combination of the day and thermal and applying to the applying to the machine learning as well as to the sensor fusion at the end to all of the, the sensor sources does enhance the situation and and gives as good as it can be in the each condition. But uh, we we have not operated all conditions yet, so it's difficult to see exact uh, to say exactly what is the real impact in the all conditions. But there is some promising, I would say, results at the moment that we can enhance the situation pretty well in the in the what they currently see by their eyes from the, the from from the bridge. Right. Um, then let's. Um, go a little bit back to NVIDIA's presentation, and in particular, uh, Azir, uh, you were also showing some examples of what is uh, possible with uh, the Jetson Nano. Um, but we had a question about like what else uh, beyond those examples that you showed. Perhaps you have some good examples to, to just highlight from the community that you have been seeing. For instance, there was a question about uh, human emotion detection or or like facial detection type of thing. Uh, would that be also possible with mm -hmm. Jetson? Yes, of course. It depends on the model. So, of course, if you use a model that is used the sentient detection and it, it will perfectly run on a Jetson Nano. Usually these models are not big, are not, are not really big. Mm -hmm. Even I, I have run, not in a nano, but I have run the GPT-2 that probably is familiar for the people working on NLP, GPT-2 on uh, Jetson NX. Not on the nano, but the GPT-2 small model runs. So you can you can have a conversation, kind of conversational interface with the Jetson NX. Uh, not yet with the nano, but probably we will get there because models are getting smaller and smaller. So basically, a nano is like a small GPU. The only limitation usually is the the memory and a bit of the compute power uh, but yeah um, there there are some people doing pretty advanced um for example in in recycle in recycle plants like for example detecting plastics from glass in a high with a high speed camera that is doable even with a jetson in some cases uh, maybe you need to in some cases maybe you need to go up and go to an nx or an aex but almost any object detection or OpenCV algorithm runs in a nano. Uh, so yeah, I think the limitation is the imagination here and the, and the size of the model. Yeah, you just have to be creative uh, to figure that out. Um, really, really cool. And, and the demos also um, were really great to see today. Um, I would now like to go back to Jesus. And um, well, I know uh, that you have also been working uh, in sense of fusion for situational awareness for the automotive industry, uh, so a bit different setting. So I was wondering if you could open up a little bit uh, the differences between uh, maritime and uh, automotive. Like, what are the main challenges that are different in in the maritime uh, setting for for this uh, type of uh, trying to create the situational awareness? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, I guess one of the main differences is first of all that um, in a car you need to react really fast. Uh, you cannot miss even half a second, otherwise it's like really dangerous. While in a, in a vessel it's more like you can be slow, but you need to be very precise. You need to be very careful because those huge container ships, if you take the wrong decision, then uh, you cannot stop it anymore. Um, but then of course the sort of um, sensors that we use and the sort of challenges um, perhaps I can share this other video while I speak. Um, in a car, you have um, a so-called fixed uh, that heading and course. Um, so typically, where you are like looking toward, you you will go that direction, unless you are like uh, racing in a in a rally and um, 
pretty much in the sea, we are always in a rally sort. We are always drifting over the water. And that make it uh, more difficult to estimate um, to estimate where you're going to be. Uh, but then also the fact that the water is uh, bouncing the vessel up and down makes our um, elevation not fixed. And the fact that we're looking so, so far away makes also this sort of uh, understanding where an object is um, far away is also very, very difficult. Um, perhaps this is not the best uh, example to explain that. I can move to a further slide that I have somewhere here. If you may see the slides now, but I'm moving forward. Yeah, we can see that. Um, nice. Uh, so, so really, when we look, um, maybe you cannot see the numbers. These are basically the distances estimated to the vessels. Uh, when we look far toward the horizon, as we need to do in the maritime, um, because we are moving at fast, relatively fast speeds and we have like a relatively very um, little maneuver capability to to correct our course. So you need to estimate uh, how very, very well, things that are very, very far, and even a tiny, tiny error there on, on your orientation and, and so on can mean a huge kilometers error. So it's um, really tricky in that sense. You need to be, like I said, you can be slow, but you need to be very, very precise. While in the cars, it's more about being fast, being able to react. Um, so yeah, those are some of the main uh, differences that I see. Um, yep. OK. Cool. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the insights. Um, just a reminder quickly, uh, I, have, I see you have been answering uh, quite many questions in text. So if you want to read the answers already that we have, they are in the answered uh, section. So just one more question for you about the pilot that you mentioned. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to know a bit more about the future. You said the first pilot is now um, happening uh what what is coming next for for Groke as a company are you planning to move on some bigger pilots uh what, what is kind of the future plan here yeah so we are coming little by little be, be, from the behind the screen <laughs> but uh, yeah next one we will we will do to the other pilots into the especially as i said in the japan with with our potential customers but then of course the product launch is coming and that's why i didn't went really deep into the our product details yet since we have to keep the momentum and uh, we have a product in the marketplace by the end of this year the first product and second product will follow very early next year so it is it is coming it's a really exciting time we have been pushing hard now about a year, year and a half, and, and it's coming in the time where, where we see the result. Okay. Uh, well, at least we'll be looking forward to the product launch then. Um, but uh, anyways, I'm afraid uh, we don't have time for more questions this time. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, we will do a webinar recap uh, next week, and I will include there um, some of the questions and answers that we had here already in written. And then also I will try to chase down some of our great speakers today uh, if there are some extra questions that we didn't have time uh, to answer in this during the show. So that uh, keep, keep following um, our channels for the recap and then next week. And you will get this webinar as a recording uh, tomorrow to your inbox. Um, just to remind you, so this was the last one before the summer break that we're having, but we're going to have a few more coming up still uh, in the fall. So far, we've had more than 1,500 viewers for our webinars this year. So it's been really like great to organize this for you, and, and you have helped us a lot uh, in putting this together. I would like to give a big hand we always clap a lot here at Silo uh, to our speakers. Uh, NVIDIA, thank you for partnering with us for this webinar. And then also, uh, obviously, Juha from Groke and Jesus, thank you so much for, for sharing these. Um, I'm going to put a feedback form, um, apparently twice, uh, to the comment section. So if you have any feedback, uh, please, please uh, give us some. And uh, finally, here is our contact details. And we'll be in touch then uh, via email later on with the recording. 
So thank you all and hope you have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paulina. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.